welcome to the very first episode of the Reptiles and Research podcast. I'm hosting this, Liam Sinclair, along with Ellie Hills, my co-host. Hello. Welcome, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's a great way to start it. Today's episode is going to focus on gut loading, and we're going to talk about the research projects that we've both done um is it theses is theses the plural thesis i think theses isn't it i think it's yeah thesis we 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 know it's well. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about the fact that we've both done gut loading aspects in our theses um i kind of went a bit overboard with mine so we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about what gut loading really is its original intentions how to go about it properly And we're going to talk over some things that I can't really put in a normal YouTube video, but this longer format allows us to go over things in greater detail. Before we get into the nitty gritty, we do have sponsors. Yes, we're going that. First of all, we need to thank Custom Rectal Habitats for sponsoring the podcast. You can head on over to the description for an affiliate link. If you click through there, it will take you straight to Custom Rental Habitats, or you can go in the pinned comment in the comment section. If you do buy something, a certain percentage of revenue comes back to the channel and no extra cost to you. And we would like to thank our other sponsor, the Reptile Merch Store, for sponsoring our podcast as well. If you head on over to www.thereptilemerchstore.com, you could find some really cool reptile merch designs that you can wear on your chest. I think the best place to start to go over what we actually did in our theses um, regarding gut loading. And Ellie, I'll let you start off what you actually did in your thesis. My one wasn't really, it wasn't based on gut loading as such. I had four different species of invertebrates that were being used as feeders. So I did um, silkworms, dubia roaches, um, locusts, and then um, mealworms as well. And um, I fed them just a generic um, leafy green diet. And then um, the four species were compared on um, four different nutrients. So it was um, vitamin content, calcium, um, phosphorus, and then it was also fat content because I wanted to look at energy sources as well. Um, And then it was comparing which of those um, four feeders um, was the highest or lowest in each one. And then comparing because my study was linked to nutritional wisdom. Um, so I was comparing to see which of the four feeders out of the ones given was the best choice, if that makes sense. Do you want to go over what nutritional wisdom actually is? Um, so nutritional wisdom is the innate built in behavior of um, animals selecting what is best for them out of the wild. Um, so in theory um they should within their own selves know which um feeders or plants are better for themselves to eat what was your one based on with gut loading so basically what i did was i did a systematic review and meta-analysis of uh gut loading crickets um So within that, I used Boolean search terms, which is basically a combination of keywords to find all the gut loading studies in relation to crickets uh, from the window 2000 to 2020 or 21, whatever year that I did it was. But within that, I actually read quite a few uh, mealworm studies, locust studies. Um, We can dip into that just a little bit later but for the most part it was a real deep dive into how to gut load crickets properly the reason i focused on crickets so much is because in countries like the us you can't really have locusts due to agricultural laws so the most common feeder is crickets so it made sense to actually focus on the most common feeder for the information to be the most helpful and of course crickets are actually actually the most studied invertebrate feeder that would actually make the study viable did you find that most of your um because when i was looking a lot of the gut loading was actually around human studies no 
no, none of it was. Actually, I didn't find anything on human studies. I found a few by, I'm going to butcher his name, but it's like Unsink or something. Unisink or he also produced some like uh, some strange bit of dragon studies that I've come across in the bit of dragon deep dive as well. But for the most part, it was for um, pest culture. So it was quite targeted. It was a lot of zoos doing the studies. It, there wasn't a lot like private collections doing it. So, and the methodologies varied really widely. So it was quite hard to compare them. Because I think my one where I look, was looking at protein, a lot of it was human studies. Which that makes sense. It's probably using it for alternative food sources, isn't it? To yeah. the future sort of thing. So I think it's probably best to try and to find what actually gut loading is. Now, the origins of gut loading originally was the fact that insects by nature aren't high in calcium unless very specific species. So your crickets, locusts, they don't have a skeleton, so they aren't storing calcium. And what they are is actually very, very high in phosphorus compared to calcium. And our captive vertebrates generally require a calcium to phosphorus ratio of two to one for healthy homeostasis in the body, especially in the blood plasma and calcium levels, which plays massive roles in cal- uh, sorry, uh, in muscle contraction, um, cell health, and it's even like the firing of neurons is like calcium absorbed as well, isn't it? Yeah. So the origins of gut loading was trying to raise these feeder insects above at least a one-to-one ratio where they're equal or ideally up to a two-to-one ratio. So the original concept was trying to fill the guts full of calcium to raise the calcium to phosphorus ratio to at least one-to-one to two-to-one. That was the very bare bones basics origin of gut loading. Of course, now it's kind of gone in a different direction. Um, Some people aren't really aware of what the actual origin of what gut loading is supposed to be. There are a few misconceptions that people would just think it means uh, just feeding table scraps to your your crickets and whatnot. But it's actually more complex than that. Um, And that was what I found. Do you want to... Do you want to see what I did for my for my thesis? Yeah, go on then. Blow me away. Okay, so if you're listening on a podcasting platform, um, you can find the visual version of this on the YouTube channel, Reptiles and Research. There'll be a video counterpart to this, and you can see what I'm about to share on my screen. So let me just share my screen with you one second. So this is my master list of studies. In total, there was uh, 68 studies. And that doesn't include things that I removed that weren't cricket specific. So the amount of gut loading literature that is out there is gargantuan. But the premise was I used keywords, which you can actually see right here. I will zoom in for those of you that are viewing on a mobile, which will make this quite difficult. Um, I focused on a strict set of nutrients that actually the crickets themselves weren't actually already containing. So things like um, protein was not a target for me research-wise of gut loading because obviously crickets already have a good amount of protein and actually quite a lot of the amino acids that are required. Each and every invertebrate species also has different amino acids compositions. Some of them have things that others lack which is why it's really important to just not stick to a solid monoculture diet of one species of invertebrate you really want to vary the diet because the different combinations and different levels build up a more balanced diet but these are the keywords that we focused on so this is uh obviously cricket gut load reptile um calcium Vitamin E, vitamin A, retinol, beta carotene, B carotene, omega-6 and omega-3 and fatty acids. So those were the focuses of my research, but you can see the vast amount of studies that I came across. 
Um, this is actually the same methodology that I've used for the deep dive, if, if anyone's wondering. So, so the bit of dragon deep dive, I, I've gone to this level, <laughs> but we'll stick to this for now. Um, and then I actually, obviously, I removed duplicates and then I made notes on all the studies and I color coded it on a new sheet and I dialed it down further so what's relevant. I categorized it by year, uh, whether it was gray or published literature. So gray literature means that it wasn't published in a scientific journal. That could be anything from a unpublished thesis or some sort of proceeding that's not necessarily considered white literature. And white literature is basically published research. And I also went, categorized all of it by long, longitudinal data or value-based data. So value-based data was the studies that were focusing on getting uh, X international units of retinol, which is vitamin A, in the crickets in the end, or whether it was based on longitudinal results when they were fed to the end consumer. So th there are some longitudinal studies talking about uh, things like lepidic hepatic liver storage and how they're converted beta carotenoids into retinol for the body. And we'll go into that later on as well. Beta carotenoids have much more of a role to play than people realize, but it isn't set in stone either because there's a lot of research that hasn't been done and there's a lot that we are unsure of. Um, and this will go into why I've actually ended up agreeing with the Arcadia supplement routine because of the research I found in this. But more on that in a minute. In a minute. Um, and then basically I've just categorized them by vitamin. But the main thing that I want to just, 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 just to preface this before we go any further is that there is a lot of myths that uh, crickets are bad feeders and that you should replace that with dubia roaches. I completely disagree with that. I think it's quite silly to not use the feeder that has the most gut loading studies done on them they're probably one of the only species that we know to a t and actually to some actual levels of international news exactly how to gut load properly so to remove crickets from the diet um i would think would be ill-advised um I don't know how in depth your gut learning research went with, with your thesis. It wasn't like this at all, no. I like how organized you are with that. Oh, I, I broke my <laughs> back doing this. <laughs> this was pure depression. <laughs> oh, it's a lot of hours and tears, I can see it already. Yeah, it really was. Um, um, so you didn't actually do any like nutritional lab studies at all? It was all looking at um, other people's results? No, yeah, it was compiling the research that was already out there it was a systematic review and uh, meta-analysis using the data extracted from already published research and then obviously the great literature as well whereas you actually did um nutritional analysis didn't you i shall stop, stop sharing my screen here hopefully that comes up in the recording if not i'm gonna just plant in fake pictures <laughs> as if i was actually sharing in the video but i could should... see it that's the main thing yeah um, the end result, everyone will be able to see it one way or the other. I'll edit that in. But yeah, you actually did actual nutritional analysis. So how did that go? Yeah, I got my little lab coat on. Um, it was actually quite a long process. We and um, first thing you had to freeze dry. So you have to put um, all of, well, I had to go all the way from euthanasia. Um, so I did a lot of studies about the ethical um, way to um and little bug lives um and then from that point i um freeze dried them and then cooked them and then blended them up into a little ash and then we did loads of um different um dilators and chemicals and that kind of thing to come up with our um, results so what were the results that you found um so I found surprisingly, so um, my main interest was silkworms because not a lot of people have done much. Um, they're quite limited for gut loading because all they can have or willingly accept is mulberry, um, the mulberry leaves. And um, 
but naturally they are incredibly high in calcium um, to the point where people suggest that you don't have to um, dust them at all um, but I was actually quite surprised because they were so high in fat that we actually physically couldn't dry them out um, everything else became ash but they became like um, like a paste and that's all we could get out of it um, I guess that's part of like you said the very diet because they're so good at giving that calcium um, but at the same time you're giving something that's really really fatty um, so they're not I wouldn't necessarily class them as like a treat but it's more as something that I wouldn't feed lots of because of that fat level um, but unfortunately that the silkworms was part of the we had um technical malfunction so the calcium machine actually broke literally halfway through my study with my equipment and um, my samples in there um so yeah that's a mystery that hasn't been solved yet sadly yeah well that's unfortunate. all that money all that time and um yeah but well, like i said it was <laughs> it was yeah really oh <laughs> well, that's, that's... yeah there's a few tears shed over that one okay moving on i think from my study the locusts and the dubias were actually very similar um in terms of like calcium and protein and things like that another thing that actually was really really apparent that I think a lot of keepers aren't aware is how much how you actually house the the crickets especially and other live food affects the results of your gut loading so there, there's so much information to unpack here the very temperature you keep them at affects the amount of calcium that ends up being in them as an end result now it was anything below 26 degrees ended up being less than a one-to-one -one ratio of calcium. And it was anything above 26 degrees that was actually achieving decent results. And then you've also got other factors such as security. In one, one master thesis by Attard, I think the, the uh, author was, when she put the crickets in, they ate equally from separate, from separate petri dishes one was in a secure place near the egg cartons and one was in the open. Now, the consumption was equal within the first um, day, I believe. Then after that, they consumed significantly more food in a place of security near the egg cartons. So the very place you actually place the gut-loading food affects the results of the efficiency and optimization of that. So the very way that you even put the food in the container affects how well they gut load, which I think's crazy. It seems common sense now that you've read it, but when I first read that, I was like, wow. We kind of focus so much on like feeders feeding animals that we forget that they have their own little needs. Yeah, you almost forget that these animals are actually, even though they're just food to us, they're still there trying to live out their lives and they have their own needs in terms of security and whatnot. So the main thing is, well, the elephant in the room in terms of gut loading is, do you go for a commercial dry diet or do you go for your fresh veg options? Now, there's obviously very different schools of thought. If you have things like a commercial dry diet, very, very, very small particulates, which means they can't engage in selective feeding. And what that means is that they can't pick and choose certain foods over others. So you're not getting an imbalance of nutrients. They have to eat everything as a whole, as, as it comes to them. And you can control what nutrients go in at that stage. And that's very good for calcium. But calcium is not very palatable to a lot of, of feeder species so it needs to be almost like slipped in with the dog medicine, if that makes sense. It needs to be going in with the more palatable food as a whole. So when you have something such as you're feeding in fresh fruit and veg, if you fed, let's say, a commercial diet that would allow them to get the calcium in with this commercial diet, but then you gave them a slice of apple for moisture, well, what that actually does is means that 
the crickets prefer the more palatable apple and they will go eat the apple slice preferentially over the gut loading diet, which means they're filling their gut with something and they're not even eating enough calcium to reach that one to one ratio. So if you're going to use a commercial diet, you need to be providing water, ideally, uh, whether that's like uh, wet paper towels them to drink from, whether that's like a sponge within like some sort of water dish that they can not drown. You basically have to provide ad lib fresh water in a way that stops them from drowning. Otherwise, you're going to negatively influence your gut loading diets by providing fresh produce. And that is something that I see a lot. You see a lot of YouTube videos where people are like, yeah, use this cricket diet here. And then they're giving like apple slices and orange slices or carrot as like the moisture content. But what's actually happening is they're not getting the results they want by doing that. Yeah. I saw someone suggesting cucumber, just like a slice of cucumber in there with it. And you're like, cucumber literally has is water. You're not adding anything. And that's probably going to take away from the gut loading diet they actually provide as well. And then on the other camp, some studies was actually showing, um, one study showed they compared a commercial diet to fish flakes to fresh veg like carrot and red bell peppers and things like that. The fresh veg actually had the highest carotenoid accumulation in three species of cricket compared to the commercial diet and the fish flakes. So in certain aspects, the fresh food diet was better at that than the actual commercial diet. But then there's no calcium in the fresh food diet. So there's another conundrum to get to at the end. So you can see how I was actually going back and forth and getting really, really confused with how the best way to go about this was. And this is only for crickets. Imagine how deep down the rabbit hole you can go for every single species that, of feed that you feed. Yeah, and then if you think you can even like divide that even more and think about gut loading for specific species to be fed to, because not every reptile is going to have the exact nutritional requirements either. Yeah, exactly. And then there's a whole other aspect to this where what I found was that certain nutrients certain nutrients do just sit in the gut and the traditional sense of gut loading. Some nutrients are actually accumulated in the tissues of crickets in particular as they grow. So vitamin E not only will be in the gut, but it's actually elevated into the tissue content of the cricket as it grows. So you're feeding a diet high in vitamin E to that cricket as it's growing on the nutritional value in terms of vitamin E anyway of that cricket grows with that. So not only is there an aspect of just gut loading, there's also the nutrition of the animal as it grows. But then how do you get both of these scenarios right? So you raise the calcium levels as well as get these other aspects in line. Because calcium is only in the gut content for um, 48 hours before Sometimes it was 72, but for the most part, after that, it drops again after the fourth day. But other nutrients take, take just that amount to actually come into effect. So how do you actually combine all of this to get the right amount? And that's what I was struggling with for ages. And I had a, quite a lot of realizations along the way, even this year, long after I did this thesis, and this is because of the talk from Beardy Vet. What Beardy Vet was saying about wild bearded dragons, and this is a spoiler for the bearded dragon deep dive if anyone is going to watch that. So bearded dragons in the wild are eating a lot of salvia, which is wild sage. And you were there as well, Eddie. Both of us were here. Um, salvia has a calcium to phosphorus ratio of 20 to 1. So this is why bearded dragons aren't getting deficient in calcium when they're eating high amounts of phosphorus in these bugs in the wild, because their veg content or the herbaceous vegetation of their diet 
so high in calcium that it's offsetting the amount of phosphorus that's in the bugs and the lack of calcium in the bugs. And then there's probably an aspect of the bugs are also eating these high CA plants as well. So that's how they naturally are getting gut loaded. But in captivity, I was starting to think, well, if you're getting a really high calcium in the veg content in the diet for a bearded dragon, do I need to prioritize calcium in the gut loading for the live food if I'm surely replicating these conditions, if that makes sense? Because I'm feeding wild sage. So I thought that, well, that makes sense. You don't really need to prioritize calcium in the gut loading if you know you're getting a lot of calcium in the diet and other aspects. And then I thought, well, what about something that's purely insectivore and then not eating these high CA plants? So the conclusion that I have come to is that I'm actually not going to prioritize calcium at all in the gut loading. And I'm purely going to just make sure that I dust bugs with pure CA each time to raise their CA value externally. And then prioritize feeding for carotenoids, etc., in the gut loading proportion. Because otherwise, if you're going to also feed these fresh fruit and vegetables for the high vitamin E content and whatnot to raise these colony of insects, what you're going to have to do is feed like the maintenance colony in a certain way to make sure that they're growing and nutritious. But also you're going to have to take out a batch that you're going to feed off X date and feed them with a commercial diet to raise that CA level. And I think for most keepers, that's just faffing about, isn't it? Yeah. Although I do that, but I can understand why a lot of people wouldn't do it. I mean, I, I did this as my thesis, and that was the conclusion. I come up with all, di- all these ideas, and I don't do it. It's too I much for the average keeper. Also, out of, like, all nutrition, um, synthetic vitamins are worse than calcium so easy to put into a pad form to put on things it's not it's going to be better to do it that way than trying to synthet, like synthesize all of the other nutrition if that makes sense it's just so hard i mean even the in the amount of international units of different vitamins like retinol or something or other that's so variable and we don't even know the nutritional requirements of the end consumer anyway. I mean, the, the only reason that they know exactly the nutritional requirements of things like cats and dogs is basically they had to torture these animals to work it out in the first place. They had to give them this level. Does this overdose them? Does this cause deficiency? And they had to systematically work that out and basically torture a bunch of animals to come to the conclusion of the units that they need. Obviously, nowadays, that's not going to pass ethical reviews, so that's not going to happen. So there's a lot of guesswork, and a lot of the nutritional requirements of stuff is based on the National Research Centre's recommendations for things like rats. So it's a very imperfect way to compare things to begin with in terms of what values we're actually providing. And then we look at things in terms of uh, carotenoids. This is the thing. This is the thing that really annoys me. We talk about old beta carotene carotenoids. It's much safer to provide than vitamin A. Never provide pure vitamin A in vitamin form because it's much safer and you can overdose on vitamin A. Always feed carotenoids. And there's a little bit of marketing of some products that have gone really heavy in that regard. And I, I don't agree with it. The reasoning because is that we actually haven't proven out what species can actually convert Uh, carotenoid precursors into retinol vitamin A in the first place so it has been proven that lipid geckos can convert beta carotene into vitamin A so the, the study actually measured the hepatic liver storage of retinol um, before and after given carotenoids and it did elevate 
But and then there's another species of toad, I think, did the same. But there's also studies on other amphibian species and other lizard species where they didn't actually convert it. So we don't actually know how many of these species actually convert it until we actually study it on an individual basis. And logistically, that's not going to happen for the vast majority of species that we keep, especially if you're one of the people that we intend to have on this podcast and you're keeping some of the niche and nerdy. I love how we're going to coin, we're just going to coin that catchphrase you've come up with now. If you're keeping <laughs> some of the niche and nerdy species, there's no way that anyone's actually done a really detailed thing to work out exactly whether you convert this and convert that. So it would be, in my eyes, anyway, like, tell me if you disagree with this, but I think it's silly to assume that all of them can convert it when it's been proven otherwise that some haven't converted it. Especially because I think if you look at um, some species are really sensitive to vitamin A, A deficiencies, so for example, terrapins and things like that. And then on the other flip side, you have Jackson's chameleons who are really sensitive to vitamin A overdosing. Um, there's definitely variety within um, species for sure. Well, that's the thing. Um, this is why I've kind of come to the conclusion that I agree with Arcadia's supplement routine. Do you know the, the, the wheel routine you can find on their like guide? Basically what they go through, they go through like the whole um, Earth Pro-8, which has calcium carbonate as well as um, beta carotid and obviously different precursors. And then right at the end of the cycle, you have revitalized D3, which obviously provides uh, D3 and pure retinol. And the actual theory behind that was that there are some things like leopard geckos that do eat insects, but maybe like at the end of a week, they might be able to eat like a small gecko or something and get pure retinol in that form. Because the only way you actually get the pure retinol is from animal flesh. So unless you're actually predating upon another vertebrate, you're not getting that pure retinol. So that's the reasoning behind why that retinol at the end exists. My reasoning was, I think it's a good idea to do this um, carotenoids and stuff because it does play health roles outside of just converting to retinol. But in the off chance we have something that doesn't convert it, I think at the very end, just to add that little bit of retinol as like that, safety blanket i think that's a good idea i mean it's, it's probably logical that omnivorous species like beer the dragons probably can convert carotenoids given that half their diet is herbivorous but for a lot of species it's just not proven on beer the dragons either so for the sake of having that safety blanket i think it's wise to provide vitamin a in its pure form or at least and you know it's synthetic pure retinal form at the end just to make sure that getting some form of retinol and not a pre in its precursor form in the diet just in case they can't convert it we just don't realize it does that make sense to you yeah that does you might as well cover all bases because you don't know and there's there's also studies in things like red-eyed tree frogs where uh, beta carotene actually increased the bacterial diversity in their skin which have plays like into health roles for them so the carotenoids are good i'm not saying don't obviously i'm not saying don't bother with carotenoids and stuff because that's good you kind of you never said whether or not you felt like the commercial diets were a good thing or a bad thing so i feel like the commercial diets as a whole are the most optimal way of doing it if you're going to do things buy the book properly and maximize the potential i think that the commercial diets are the way to go the only downside is the commercial diets are expensive and even though logistically speaking and uh, numerically speaking they can yield the best results i still don't do it because the financial aspect of that I think they are invaluable to people starting out as well. If you were coming into the reptile world and you didn't have any understanding about nutrition and someone said, here's a bag of food to feed your bugs and it does everything you need, 
some people just go for that and that's not a bad thing we do it in cats we do it in dogs we can feed them raw um and you make the diet yourself but that bag of dog food that provides everything you need is just the easiest way to go about it and it just makes sure you've covered all your bases and it's the same with reptiles i think they i'd rather people were going down that route than just feeding lettuce in a tub and thinking they're hitting it when they're not yeah and just to double down on that not all gut loading diets are equal like (laughs) generally it was from my findings you had to get uh it was anywhere from seven percent to eight percent or nine sorry seven percent to nine percent ca as a portion of the gut loading uh, diet for it to actually even achieve the one-to-one ratio in the cricket so there were some things that claims to to do that and they didn't they really didn't they fell short when compared to other things so one of the good ones which the americans can get which i'm really jealous of is i think it was the missouri gut loading diet or something like that we can't get that in the uk i tried i tried to find it so bad i couldn't there's definitely ones that i've picked up and i've looked on the back and all is in it is like filler stuff bran it's (laughs) It's always bran yeah (laughs) it's bran and potato and rice (laughs) potato and rice yeah (laughs) they're like (laughs) i think is it the cytic acid as i pronounce it in bran actually is actually calcium binding i have no idea i'm afraid um if anyone's listening and i've got that wrong please correct me but i believe it's uh cytic acid in bran that actually is calcium binding or inhibiting or something along those lines um and it's also counterintuitive to actually be feeding that when you're trying to raise calcium and whatnot so when you get the really cheap ones that are full of bran it's just you might as well just burn your money just set your money alight because you're not doing what you want to do also that like puts into play Everywhere you buy um, the feeder bugs, what do they come in? They come in with that bran. They're probably being being raised on that bran. And then as the majority of keepers, they probably only feed those bugs for a couple of days before they put them in. Um, It just makes you think about how much of that actually does go into our reptiles. Yeah, what you're supposed to do and what I, I do as well, is you're supposed to take that tub, get a larger uh, container, take those bugs put them in that container remove the bran entirely bin that bran and get those bugs feeding on something a bit more appropriate well that's a commercial diet you can go that route um or fresh vegetables either way you want the bran out of there and that's what i try and tell customers all the time but i think they feel like i'm just trying to shake them down and get them to spend more money on a tub they don't need as another misconception, a lot of them seem to feel like if they buy it quick enough from the wholesaler and if they feed them all on day one, that they're already gut loaded. That isn't the case. They're already dehydrated and probably void of gut content by the time they've actually been in transit and got to wherever you're buying them from. That's not how gut loading works. I can attest to like every single time I buy bugs, as soon as I put food in there, they're straight on it as if they haven't eaten for days. And I can believe that they're just so hungry every single time. The old like 40 hours rule, you'll see, you'll hear all the time, like that there's like, oh yeah, feed for 40 hours before you feed. The reason that was is because in the earlier gut loading studies, it would take 40 hours for the calcium content in the gut of the cricket to actually reach a one-to-one ratio in earlier studies. Now, if you're not even focusing on calcium in your gut loading and you're focusing on things like carotenoids and you're feeling things like red bell peppers in like a fresh carrot, then that rule isn't as important, I would say. I would say it's in them as long as they've eaten to their heart's content and they're full then there's that content within their gi system again feeding them properly and things like vitamin e 
and as it accumulates in their actual tissue, that's a whole other ball game. Um, and it's down to a nutrient by nutrient basis. And that makes things even more confusing. And so I have come to a system which generally the hobby has come to for a large part and how to do it in a way that makes sense for your everyday keeper to do and get the best way possible. And I think we pretty much do it on a very similar basis. So my main targets are carotenoids. So I'm trying to target uh, beta carotene, zeaxanthin, and lutein are my main targets for carotenoids. Now, all of that is within carrots, red bell peppers, and I believe green bell peppers, or the yellow. Either way, I cycle through all the colors of bell peppers. I just feed them all. Um, I always get zeaxanthin and lutein like mixed up, so as in to what they're in. Um, and that's also in things like butternut squash and things like that. So that sort of grouping of things that are pretty good to feed. I house my cockroaches and I feed really well in that way to constantly be feeding them a good diet. And then things that are high in vitamin E, like pumpkin, I think is high in vitamin E. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, I haven't actually looked at what does what so far. I've just kind of settled into my routine of what veg I'm feeding, if that makes sense. Originally, I knew what I was doing, but now I'm just kind of like knowing what I'm, like it's um, second nature to what things I'm trying to feed. Yeah, so Google the what veg are high in vitamin E, and I would be feeding that to my crickets to raise that in their bodies as they grow. So what I'm looking to have is obviously a large maintenance colony long term of what I'm trying to feed and feed that really well and varying it in fresh produce. I'm not using commercial gut loading diets because their entire aim is to go for that short 40 hour period to raise the CA ratio and also get in the other nutrients at the same time. I'm completely forsaking uh, calcium in my gut loading routine which is also the original premise of gut loading but I don't see a point in trying to gut load when I can just powder them with calcium powder the main issue is is this if you're a chuck in the enclosure and let them roam around and let the animal hunt when it wants then that does become an issue um it was, it was crickets can crickets can basically groom off calcium within like two minutes it was found in, st in studies so if you're doing what I'm doing and you're purely just calcium dusting, then you risk the cricket going off and grooming off the calcium before your animal eats it. So what I do is I make sure that that cricket is eaten immediately so that I'm seeing the bearded dragon eat that powder on it, if that makes sense. The benefit to gut loading for CA is that it takes them a lot longer they can't just groom off gut content. They have to actually go a series of hours to actually avoid the gut content before they eat something else and stuff and change their profiles and the GI tract before they actually lose it. So it's a much more longitudinal way of providing calcium, ensuring it's in there. So if you are the type that's going to be to chuck it in there and leave it, then it might be worth gut loading for calcium. This entirely depends on the way that you feed and your goals. Again, there's more than, one, more than one way to skin a cat, I think that's the saying. But I completely forsake the calcium in my routine anyway, just because for the BD, I'm also feeding high CA foods like dandelions and salvia anyway, as well as using calcium powders. I'm using the Arcadia Earth Pro A because I also want to um, use probiotics um, in my diet. And it just so happens that the supplement routine by Arcadia actually uses things in that, which makes it cheaper for me in the long run as well. I haven't actually researched into things like um, bee pollen and the actual full deep dive of that. I very much stuck to my, I very much stuck to my nutrient categories there. But there's the other things I don't really know much about that are included, and financially it makes more sense for me to use that. And yeah, I just basically cycle around the Arcadia routine. Um, and I've actually come up with that on my own without 
realizing that we both come up with the same supplement routine independently, but for different reasons, it ended up being the same. Of course, you can actually just do that by using a multivitamin once a week as well. So I feel like I've pro- we've probably confused a few people who are like new to gut loading. We're talking about zeaxanthin and lutein stuff, and they just sat there like, what? <laughs> I thought I just had to feed vegetables. Generally, you kind of do, but it's if you select for generally the right kinds of vegetables, um, then you're hitting these nutrient profiles in a much better way. And then the other thing that I studied was um, omega six to omega omega-3 to omega-6 ratios um, in captivity we're actually providing a high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio whereas in the wild the ratio is flipped there wasn't much information on there being any longitudinal negative effects in captive reptiles based on this but the nutritional content are actually flipped now you can level out these profiles by including things high in omega-3 like uh, flaxseed oil and stuff I've tried to do that. It's expensive. I've not seen any longitudinal damage to the reptiles from this ratio so far. Anyway, this is a major reason why I think some people are going back to feeding wild caught insects as well. We cannot obtain the same nutritional content as what wild insects do. We can't do it. There's studies that have compared uh, wild insects to what we've got in captivity. And it was vitamin A that I was looking at in particular. I think the captive ones got to like 4,000 international units or something. And then the wild insects were at like something silly, like 160,000 or something or 80,000 or something. But it was, astro- I don't know the exact numbers, don't quote me on that, but it was astronomically higher in the wild insects. So we're still not getting, replicating whatever is happening nutritionally with these wild insects, which is why. I'm actually looking to dabble with the wild caught insects myself. There's a lot of chameleon groups that are really heavily into feeding wild caught insects as well, aren't there? Yeah, and there's also some that are really, really against it. It's really controversial, understandably. Understandably. I mean, it's like, again, each keeper has their own like level of accepted acceptable risk. Um, everyone's willing to take less or more risk depending on how they feel about the situation. And I'm feeling particularly risky. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it before. I've fed um, wild um, moths and things, and I, I was either lucky or, but he absolutely loved them. My panther chameleon, and he never had any problems with it. I mean, um, I've but... fed like house spiders and what like that. So and, and wild moths. So I've done it as well, and I've never had an issue. Um, I think as long as you're, you should be screening for parasites anyway, as part of your routine, because you can get parasites from um, feeder insects, um, like crickets, they can come with that as well. So as long as you're screening, um, you're being careful about where you're thinking about collecting them, then they should be in theory fine. I think I saw somewhere, it was in a chameleon group where I, I think, don't quote on whether that's true or not, but I saw one of the admins, which is one of the like really, really into studies and stuff, one of those sorts of types. Um, I think they said it's more the probability of receiving parasites through food was actually higher in commercial live food than in wild caught stuff, which I find quite interesting. Well, it does make logical sense because if you've got parasites in a colony of crickets, all they do is defecate and eat in the same enclosure. They can't get away from it. In the wild, it's very much more spread out. Mm. Does that make sense? So I think the main feeders that they point to being um, things like snails and things like that in the wild are known to be carriers. Yeah, that's a whole other ball game. I think mollusks and stuff like that. I wouldn't play that game myself. You can buy captive feeder snails anyway, so I would just go that route. Um, one thing I do want to point out, anyone that is brand new to reptiles, do not go out and feed like the glow worms or fireflies, or whatever they're called, because they are toxic and that's going to straight up just obliterate whatever reptile you feed that to. 
it's the same with things like butterflies. They look pretty, they look harmless, but some of them are incredibly toxic. So unless you actually know what you are feeding, probably don't do it on a whim. Mm -mm. I think it should be in the same category as like, um, don't just go out and pick mushrooms and eat them. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily right to say feeding wild caught insects is, is instantly wrong. Um, people just can get up on their soapboxes and be like, how dare you? That's so irresponsible, blah, 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 blah. And I don't really think it's necessarily wrong to only stick to captive farm live food. I just think that if everybody comes to, a, to an understanding that each individual keeper has their own, again, acceptable level of risk, um, then you can come to the conclusion, okay, I'm not willing to do that, but fair enough if you are. And I think that's Is probably that the way to go about it. Some keepers keep outside, especially in countries outside of the UK, but even like people who keep tortoises, those tortoises are outside. They're going to be having access to these insects anyway. There's no way of stopping that. Um, and they seem to be doing fine. <laughs> Ironically, I've seen people who keep outside that got off on that soapbox to never feed wild caught insects. And like, you're keeping outside. Like they go to be eating wild caught insects. What are you talking about? <laughs> There's no way of like putting a safety net over that one. No, not at all. So I don't know, really, I, I felt like even though we've been recording for a while and this is probably probably a long episode, I feel like I've only, again, scratched the surface of how many studies I've actually read and I didn't even go into much species other than crickets. I mean, there's, there's millworm studies, there's, there's the whole shebang. So what I think I'll do is I think I will upload this file to uh, the Reptiles and Research store and you can buy this file for a pound. Again, if you're a patron, I think patrons will just be able to have access to this file. But I'll give everyone the master list to all the gut loading studies that I collected. So the six months of groundwork that I did I believe it's worth a pound. <laughs> if you don't think bypassing six months worth of work for a pound is worth it, then I don't know what to say to you, to run it. But <laughs> you, you're going to help and support run the show. So I think it's worth it. I don't think that's unreasonable. <laughs> <laughs> My pain and misery, you can have it for a pound. You don't have to go through that. <laughs> Liam cried over this. Give him some. I actually did. <laughs> I had a breakdown <laughs> at one point. But anyway, I think that concludes how far we're going to take this. I hope this at least inspired some people to go down the rabbit hole. Again, go access that file if you want to start going down the cricket rabbit hole. And I hope people stop saying crickets are a bad feeder. They're not. If anything, they're the most important feeder because they're the only feeder we understand to a high degree. So thank you, everyone that has listened to this I think this was an experimental first episode. We're learning our way. We're trying to get our sea legs or podcast legs. So <laughs> our, po our podcast legs. We're trying to get our <laughs> podcast legs and we'll see how that goes. But thanks everyone for listening. And I guess we'll see you in the next episode where we probably have a guest on. Yeah, see you around. <laughs>